We're continuing our series called Who Am I with an episode that I'm calling You Can, aka With God You Are Strong Enough. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. How many times have you ever either heard or said, I can't, I can't do that. There's no way I can get that done or I'm, I'm just not strong enough. I can't imagine trying to do that. I, I just can't. I wouldn't be able to do that. I've said that oodles of times. I don't know how many times that's been part of my vocabulary, but I'm going to try to stop doing that. Because as I read the Bible, I realize that most of the people that God worked with felt the exact same way. So when you read the Old Testament and you see God put these people in this these situations that they absolutely don't know how they're going to get to the bottom of this or see it through. And the point is they need to rely and trust on God. Abraham was called out of his homeland to go to a land, a foreign land, a land he had not known. And God promises him right away. See this land? It's all going to be yours. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a great name. Oh, and your descendants are going to be like the sand on the seashore. If you could count the grains of sand, then you could count your descendants. If you can count the stars in the sky, then you would be able to count your descendants. And Abraham is like, huh? Wow. See, the thing is, God, I don't have any children. This is kind of a problem. And God says, Abraham, I've got you. Like, it's not going to be a problem. Your servant is not going to inherit your things. You will have a son from your own body. It looked impossible. It looked impossible for Joseph to get out of that prison. And he thought he had a plan. I mean, if Joseph's in prison and he interprets the cupbearer's dream and the cupbearer is raised back up into Pharaoh's presence, then surely the cupbearer can use his power with Pharaoh to get Joseph out of this prison. But the cupbearer forgot and didn't say anything. And so there Joseph sat until God took him out of the prison. Look at Moses. When God came to him, Moses had run away from Egypt. He had gone to the land of Midian. He had gotten married. He was tending sheep. He was just fine. He was all happy on his little mountain by himself. And God appears in the burning bush and says, Moses, I need you to lead my people out of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses is like, God, you have so got the wrong person. Like, I don't know who you think I am, but I can't talk. And, you know, just find someone else because it's not me. (laughs) God's like, yeah, I know. I created you. I know your abilities and it's okay because I'll be with you. So you see how this works? It doesn't matter how strong you are. It's just about me being strong and I'll be with you. I'll do all the heavy lifting. You're just the human on earth who I need to be my mouthpiece. So let's, let's, let's go. (laughs) Moses is like, "Ah, I'm not feeling it. Gideon. Gideon is probably my favorite example. He's my all time favorite example. If you haven't read Judges chapter seven lately, go do that. Just make a point of it because the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and says, greetings, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you. And Gideon says, um, yeah, about that. See, I am, I'm not mighty or a warrior. I, I'm small and I, I come from the weakest clan. So I'm a nobody here. And God says, yeah, and I'm going to use you to deliver Israel from the hands of the Midianites. And Gideon's like, um, yeah, see, I don't know if you heard, but I'm, I'm, I'm a nobody. (laughs) God's like, I love to use nobodies. 
you know how much I love to use nobody's? Gideon tried to muster up a big army and God's like, what are you doing? I can't have you go with all those people. You'll think that you did this. 300 men, that'll be good. You take those 300 men with a trumpet and a jar and let's get this done. Now, by the way, if it's not laughable enough already, it becomes hilarious when Gideon gets to this place where the Amalekites and the Midianites are in this valley and it says they're thick as locusts. And their camels were as many as the grains of sand on a seashore. So like there were just camels and people everywhere. And Gideon has his 300 men and their trumpets and their jars. And you know what happened? When they blew their trumpets and they broke the jars, the Midianites and the Amalekites started destroying each other. And they just stood by and watched. What about the walls of Jericho? You know, God had promised Israel this land. And they got to this new land and God didn't say, okay, now you are going to have to work extremely hard to get this land that I'm telling you about. I mean, it's going to be tough. You're going to have to chisel these walls down. (laughs) He's like, no, okay, here's the plan, Joshua. So day one, you gather all the people, you march around the, the walls of Jericho once. And then do that six days. And then on the seventh day, you march around seven times and then blow your trumpets and um, shout. And the walls will come down. (laughs) It wasn't because Joshua had such a great army that they were going to defeat the people of Jericho. God was going to be with them. And in the little strength that they had, he would help them to defeat the people he wanted them to defeat. All these people went before unbelievably powerful people or were in circumstances that were way beyond anything that they could handle. And yet, because God was with them, they were able to overcome. If you read Luke chapter one, I just love Luke chapter one. I do feel a little bit sorry for the angel Gabriel. I'm not going to lie because the angel Gabriel appears first to Zechariah. He was a priest. He was going in to make a offering to do the incense. And um, the angel Gabriel came to him and said, hey, Zechariah, good news you know how you've been praying for a child? Well, God's answered that prayer. He's heard you from the minute you started praying and he's going to answer it and you're going to have a son. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and this is who he's going to be and you should name him John and da 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 And uh, Zechariah is like, I mean, here's the deal. We're old. We're beyond the age of bearing children. So how exactly is this going to work? And Gabriel said, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. As in, Zechariah, you mere mortal, who are you to question me when I see the face of God? Do you not know who God is? Do you not know what he is capable of doing? So he has that assignment, goes on his way, and six months later, he's sent to Mary. And he's saying, you know, hey, greetings, you who are highly favored. Don't be afraid. I have a message for you. You are going to be with child. And this is the, you know, son of the most high. And Mary's like, I mean, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin. So how is this going to happen? And Gabriel said, the spirit will overshadow you and nothing is impossible with God. Even Jesus, 
When, during his ministry, he had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And while they were there, he just gave them a glimpse into his glory. It's not a picture that they usually saw. Usually they saw this, this man who embraced his humanity. And he was humble and weak and just a normal human for the most part. Every now and then, you know, you saw his ability and his power a little bit of who he was as the son of God. But when they were on that Mount of Transfiguration, they suddenly saw Jesus in this magnificence and this glory in a way that they hadn't seen him before. And they come down from this mountain and they come to the other disciples and there's like a squabble going on. And this man comes up to Jesus and says, you know, I brought my son to be healed. He has an evil spirit in him and your disciples couldn't heal him. But if you can do anything, and Jesus said, if anything is possible for the one who believes, anything, think of that. So often we just look at our own weakness and that's where we that's where that's where all the dreams die. That's where everything dies right there. Just um well, I'm clearly not strong enough. I can't do this. Yeah. You're right. God's people of all time have not relied on their own strength. David when he went against the giant Goliath. Goliath was over 9 feet tall. He had been a warrior since his youth. He was covered in armor. He had an armor bearer. Who was going to defeat him? The whole army of Israel was sitting on the hillside like, well, I definitely am not strong enough. And when David went out with this little slingshot and these five stones, he wasn't going out saying, well, look at me. I'm huge and I'm a warrior too. He was saying, you know what? I come to you in the name of the God of angel armies. It's not me. I'm, I'm tiny, but God can use me. And that's how the giant fell. We have to quit looking at the circumstances. One of my favorite quotes of all time is, don't tell God how big the storm is. Tell the storm how big your God is. Look, when Peter stepped out of that boat, he saw Jesus walking across the lake. They were all terrified. I would be too. I'm not throwing stones. I would be too if I saw this whatever, this figure coming to me on the lake at night, I'd be like, wow. Um, and Jesus said, do not fear, it is I. And Peter said, Lord, if that's you, let me walk to you. And Jesus said, come. Jesus didn't say, Peter, you can't walk on water. What are you thinking? Only I can walk on water. You are too weak, my man. Get in that boat and hang on for dear life. Jesus said, come on out. Come on out, no problem. And Peter started walking on the water until he started looking at the wind and the waves and the circumstances. And then he got bummed out and he didn't believe he could do it and he started to sink. So there are so many lessons in the Bible for us to learn about this. When the people of Israel had left Egypt, so we talked about Moses calling, God calling Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. The people of Egypt, of Egypt finally let the Israelites go. They finally said, go, leave. This is terrible. We've gone through these 10 plagues, the Passover. It's just a nightmare. Just get out of our sight. We don't want anything to do with you. And they left. And then after they left, Pharaoh started thinking, wait now, hold on a second. I have let my entire workforce go. What was I thinking? So he starts chasing the people of Israel. So they get to the point where there's the Red Sea in front of them. And there's the people of Pharaoh's army behind them. So there's an army behind. There's a sea in front. And Moses says to the people, look, don't fear. Don't be afraid. The Lord's going to fight for you. You need to only be still. Don't worry about it. What was the people's reaction? They were saying, were there not enough graves in Egypt? Is that why you brought us out here? We can't do this. And they were right. They can't. 
But that's where they grumbled. We can't. And you see that all throughout the Old Testament in their journey. They get to a place of no water. We can't live like this. They get to a point of no food. We can't live like this. They get to the land of Canaan that God has promised them. They say, we can't. Those people are huge. We can't take the land. And even though God over and over and over and over again in their lives showed them, I'll part the sea. I'll give you water. I'll give you food. There came a time when their unbelief pushed God to the point of saying, okay, then you won't. You won't go into the land. That should be a lesson to us. Instead of continually saying, I can't, we need to start looking at our problems and saying, God, how are you going to work this out? I know I can't do this. So I'm going to sit back and watch you. Show me what I need to do. But I know you're big. And I can't wait to tell the story of your faithfulness and how you work through this situation. <laughs> I have a friend who sent me the most amazing message the other day and basically just saying, I can't wait to see how God's going to work in this situation. And then she sent the popcorn emoji. Like, I'm just going to sit back and eat my popcorn and watch. It was hilarious. I loved it. I hope you have friends like that in your life that can encourage you in that way. Like God is going to show up big time in this way, in, in the situation somehow, some way, which we don't know, we can't comprehend. But boy, I can't wait to see how he does it. So I'm going to give you three quick things to do when you are in your I can't situations instead of saying I can't. Because the whole reason for this message is to remind you and me, someone send this to me someday, <laughs> To stop saying I can't and to start saying you can, God. And with you on my side, I'm strong enough. Like I can get through this with the Lord. No problems. So number one, God says, call upon me, Psalm 50 verse 15. In the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you will honor me. So God says, you're in trouble. You can't call. I'm waiting. So first things first, we need to make sure we're going to God in prayer. Call upon me. God says that. It's a command. He's waiting. He's not asleep. He is not unwilling. He's not unable. Will he answer our prayers in the way we think, in the timing that we think? Maybe, maybe not. Joseph wanted to get out of prison two years before God got him out of prison. That's the way it goes. Abraham would have had a son uh, year one instead of 25. Call upon the Lord and get him involved in the situation. That's our first step. Number two, take a step. Do one thing. So start moving in the right direction. Even if you can't um, see how this is going to go, start doing something. Noah started building a boat. No. I don't know much about Noah. We're not given much about Noah, but I'm guessing when God said, okay, I'm going to destroy the world. I need you to build a boat. And um, yeah, it needs to house all the animals. Noah might have been like, uh, hmm, Whew. okay. I don't totally understand. How could he have? He hadn't lived through it before. But he started building. Take a step. I love how Moses is standing on the edge of the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army behind him. And he's giving this lecture to the people who are saying like, we're all going to die. And he's like, have faith. God's got this. Like, you need to just be still. God will take care of it. <laughs> you know what God's response was? Um, he said, get going. You need to move. So he's, Moses is telling the people, you know, 
God's got this. And God's like, why are you standing there? Move. Take a step, Moses. Like, get in the sea. Let's go. Part the sea. I'm giving you the power and move. Do what I'm asking you to do. Esther had to go to the king. God moved the king's heart. But Esther had to get the courage up to go to the king. The Israelites had to march around that wall of Jericho. Gideon and those 300 men had to show up. They weren't going to fight. They weren't going to do the fighting. They weren't going to be the ones, you know, whatever. But they, they showed up. So after you've called upon God, take the step in the right direction, whatever that may mean. And every situation will be different. But if you're asking God for a job when you're out of work, then start filling out applications. Start networking, asking people if they know of any job openings or or what have you. Um, if you're hoping to do a ministry, start doing some research. How do I do a mom's ministry? What does a prayer group look like? What are Start asking people, do you have a good Sunday school curriculum? What's worked in your Sunday school? Get together with coffee for coffee with other people or ask other people, you know, who leads the Sunday school in, in your church or start taking steps. So after you've prayed, start taking steps. Now, number three, if you start getting weary in the process, just like Peter, when he stepped out of that boat and he starts seeing the circumstances, the wind and the waves, and he's starting to lose hope, you need to remember to fix your eyes on Jesus. And part of that is you remembering that, but part of that is having people around you who can help you and remind you of that. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength a helper who can be found in times of trouble. When you start to get weary in so many of these situations are wearisome, we get weary. Have people who can point you back to God and say, hey, he's your refuge and strength. You're at the end of your strength. Yep, I get it. God's strength doesn't run out. So just remember that. And when you do, you'll quit saying, I can't. And you'll remember you can, because with God, you are strong enough. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.